right. How's everybody tonight? By God's grace, amen. Praise Jesus. Welcome those who are watching, those who are watching live, those who watch later once we upload it. Welcome in the name of the Lord. Tonight, well, it's Wednesday night before uh, Resurrection Sunday. The Lord would have taught his disciples about his coming, the Olivet Discourse. So that's our study tonight, uh, the Olivet Discourse. So on Sunday morning, we will be here for Resurrection Service, Sunday morning, 9 a.m. So make sure you tune in or you come Sunday morning, 9 a.m. And um, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Praise the Lord. Resurrection service is always a joy. It's always a joy to preach on that day, to preach God's word in the gospel. So let's come before the Lord in prayer. We have the Olivet Discourse. Father, in Jesus' name, we're so thankful that we have your word. We have your spirit, the spirit of your son. whom the scripture says, you sent it into our hearts so we can cry out, Abba, Father. And we do cry out tonight, Lord, Abba, Father. And Lord, we have the spirit of adoption, which you have set us free, free from the bondage of the law, the bondage of sin, the bondage of self, Lord God, and ultimately what held us captive, Satan, through sin, held us captive. And so, Lord, we have the, the liberty in Christ Jesus tonight for your grace and your mercy has come through your son and through his death and resurrection, we proclaim the good news, Lord, good news to all people that God can forgive sin and take away sin. And so, Lord, tonight, as we read your word, we ask you to help us understand it a little bit deeper, a little bit better, a little bit wiser unto salvation. We would leave tonight with a heart full of joy, a mouth full of truth, Lord, and ready to love and preach your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. So we do live in a world that's filled with information, no doubt. It is a world in which you can find anything on the internet, and I mean anything on the internet. I do know that uh, people are trying to restrict the internet, but as, a, as it is now, you can pretty much find anything. And at the same time, good, bad, ugly, there are some things that you can find quite a bit of it, and that is Bible teaching, quite a bit of Bible teaching. Some good, some bad, some ugly, but you can find pretty much anything you want which it could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing, especially in the area of end times and eschatology, it makes it really hard for people to know what is true and what is not because just about everybody can have a YouTube channel, just about everybody can make a video, as long as you got a camera, as long as you got a computer and an internet access, you can put it up, and it becomes really confusing because so many people come from so many different angles, especially within the circles of Christianity about the end times. Now, many Christians agree on the fundamentals of salvation. Most Christians, most true born-again Christians, agree on the fundamentals. Christian living, who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit, sin, the Word of God. But when it comes to things of the end, we call it eschatology. We call it the Lord's return. When it comes to that, people can agree. It becomes like a fight. And why is that? You know, why is the fact that we can agree on quite a bit of things about the Bible, when, but when it comes to the return of Jesus, we all fight, right? We all fight because we all take it really personal. I don't think it's the issue of the Bible. We have the same Bible, hopefully. I think it's the issue of how it's interpreted, how it's interpreted. We call that hermeneutics, right? So we can agree that Jesus died for our sins. We can agree that Jesus rose from the dead. Most true Christians believe that. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, most Christians agree that we should live a crucified life. But when it comes to Jesus coming back, we become like enemies. And it's a shame. It really is a shame. So I, I wrote down a few things why I think it's the way it is. So just before we get started, this is just sort of my, my things that I've accumulated over time on why... It's so confusing about the end times, about teaching about the Lord's return. One, I do believe that pastors and teachers, when it comes to this subject, they don't teach the Bible. What they teach, it's a theological theory or a theological um, approved system in which they agree and they just teach it. Right? So they, they have forgotten to teach the Bible and they just teach a a approved system of theology that has a lot of opinions and a lot of deductions, but it's what they preach. So they don't really, really preach the Bible when it comes to this. They just preach a system. Secondly, I think that 
sometimes teachers are not consistent in their interpretation. I'll give you an example. When it comes to salvation, the Holy Spirit, baptism, Christian living, you can find that most pastors, or most teachers, interpret it one way, pretty solid, pretty good. But when it comes to end time stuff, they completely change the way they interpret it and interpret it completely different. Completely different, meaning that the same rules of interpretation that you would use about salvation, about Jesus, about the Bible, you know, things that you understand and things that you must teach on, when it comes to the eschatology, we would call it, they use completely different rules. One example would be this. In one passage, pastors interpret the Greek language of Galatians one way, and the same passage or the same words, when it comes to the book of Revelation, they interpret them completely different. Why do they change the way they interpret Galatians to the way they interpret Revelation? Well, I think the reason why is because when it comes to the basic fundamentals, they teach it accurately. When it comes to eschatology or end times, they completely change it. Why? It may not fit with how they were taught. And so they have to change it in order to approve the system in which they teach on. The third thing is this right here. The Olivet Discourse, which we're going to be talking about tonight. Matthew 24 and 25, right? For 60 years, now take a look at this. For 60 years, the early church, talking about the early church, had no book of Revelation. I know it's a shock to a lot of Christians. But you have to think how the Bible was eventually revealed. For 60 years, the early church, after Jesus rose again and Paul began to write his letters, for 60, 6 zero, there was no book of Revelation. There were the Gospels, the letters of Paul, letters of James, or one letter of James, Peter, right? Eventually, we got John the Gospel. Eventually, we got the letters of John. And eventually, about 90 AD, it was when it was the, the book of Revelation was completed, was, was revealed to John. So how did the early church, if you were an early Christian, right, around 50 AD, what was the only thing you knew about Jesus' is coming? Where did you get your information from? The Olivet Discourse. There was no revelation, so you couldn't go to Revelation 4, 5, and 6 and try to understand it because there was no revelation 4, 5, and 6. It was Matthew 24, 25, and Luke, and also in Mark and parts of John. So the problem with today is most people, do you know where most people begin about learning about the end times? Where do they go? Where do most people tell them to go? If you want to know about the end times, where are Christians told to go? The book of Revelation, right? And what happens is, without understanding this, you won't understand the book of Revelation. And so Christians get to the book of Revelation, and they go, I can't make heads or tails about it. It's so confusing. I don't know what this is. And they close the book, and they say, see, that's why I don't study it instead of going to what the early church had from the beginning, Matthew 24 and 25, and passages like that, right? So these are some of the things that, there's more, but I just don't want to, I want to belabor the point. These are one of the reasons I think we're so confused. We're so confused regarding the end of the age. Now, it's the word eschatology. Uh, the word eschatology, it's, it's a very simple word. It just simply means the last things, the last things, Right? And ology, obviously, would be the study of, study of the final days. Uh, some terms will be like uh, eschaton. If you hear words like eschaton, it's just basically uh, a study or the time of the end, the eschaton, the last, the last days, right? And so it's concerned with the things of the end. And most Christians believe that since, I won't say most Christians, but a lot of Christians, I should say, believe since the events that have happened in our world, since, let's say, the state of Israel becoming a nation, 1948. Jerusalem coming back under the Jews in 1967. And certain things like that have led Chris, a lot of Christians to believe we are in the cusp of or in the midst of the last days. Now, they wouldn't be wrong, <laughs> completely wrong about it, because does anyone know what the Bible says the last days began? When did the last days begin? Actually, the Bible tells you when the last days began. Yeah, actually, Scott is 100% right. 
is in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the book, uh, uh, Peter quotes from the book of Joel, and he says, these are the last days. And he begins to tell him how God will pour out his spirit in the last days, and it will carry on all the way through until the end, until the Lord's return. So the last days, or the end of the age, or uh, some people call it the end times. I wouldn't call it the end times, but the end of the age, or the last days, uh, started way back in the book of Acts. But obviously, pastor, that's 2,000 years ago. Does it mean 2,000 years ago has been the last days? Biblically speaking, yeah. It's always been the last days. What you and I refer to as the last days in our own language, right, is we mean the last of the last of the last days, meaning the final week, the final seven years. That's what we think of the last days. But biblically, it's been 2,000 years of last days. What has God been doing in the last days? He's been bringing people into the kingdom, Jew and Gentile together, to come under Christ. And before his return, he wants people saved. He wants people in his kingdom. So this is what we mean by the end of the age or eschatology. Now, a lot of people today are getting caught up in quite of disturbing things. I was watching a video by a non-believer. It was completely an unbeliever. And he was almost making fun of how so many people have just crazy different views and they're panicking because so many things are happening in the world and they just think that, you know, it's, it's going to happen right now that the war, the Armageddon is going to happen and people are going to die. And, 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 and he's just wondering, like, okay, what happened? Everybody's lost their mind or what? And it's interesting that because of, like, the, the solar eclipse that's coming, I think it's April 8th, right? April 8th, yeah. Uh, and people are saying, it's speculating that this is going to be it right here, right? There's an X on the U.S. from the 2017 path to now. There's a, there's a red heifers that are ready to be sacrificed, right? And, you know, there's war in Israel, and there's rebuilding of the temple, and red heifers, and violence, and wars, and people go, I don't know what this is. And there's a lot of confusion. There is a lot of confusion and people are panicking. People are panicking. Now, as the way I would teach the, 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 the scriptures in the Bible, is, it's from Matthew 24, 25. What Jesus says about these things is, watch out for the signs, but don't fear and don't be in panic. Because things need to happen before his return. And guess one thing that the Lord never said was the red heifers. So people look to the red heifers as a sign that that's it. And there's never a passage in the Bible about looking for red heifers as a sign of the end. Now, I do believe at some point there will be a temple rebuilt, yes. But it's not time yet. And I'll, and I'll show you for in a moment why these things can be more confusing than helpful. More confusing than helpful. Because I do believe we need to really share with unbelievers the time in which we live in. I do think we are living in in some unprecedented times in which the Bible speaks about. But I don't think it's time to panic, and I don't think it's time to uh, uh, create confusion. I think there needs to be more clarity. Like the more things happen, more clarity needs to come into people's hearts and minds so they wouldn't be afraid. And I'll show you from Jesus that he says, don't be afraid, don't panic, don't be alarmed, and this is why. So no wonder people get confused. You know what people get, become too? They become skeptical. Oh, you said that about that last time, and it didn't happen. You know, there's a lot of Christians, sometimes they, 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 they make dates. They, 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 they assume things are going to happen with no biblical verses, and they speculate. It could be this day, it could be that day, it could be that day, and they hang their hats on these dates, and guess what happens on those dates? Absolutely nothing. So the unbeliever goes, I thought you said something was going to happen. And then you go, well, you know, I thought, and then so you know what the unbeliever does? They go, well, it's always going to be like that. That's wrong, you know. This is why I can't trust it. And so we have to be very careful that we don't give speculation to people, especially the believers and, and the unbelievers, because we ultimately don't want them to lose trust in this. I believe this is absolutely 100% right, that scriptures are going to be absolutely guaranteed, no problem, be fulfilled. Now, when is it going to be fulfilled? Well, that's the Lord's timing, isn't it? Even Jesus said, don't worry about the time that the Father has set in his hand. You go and make disciples. We're not to be speculation on the time 
or especially about Israel, or especially about, you know, as the disciples asked him, you know, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus said, don't worry about it now. You go and make disciples. The Father has set time in his hands, and he'll, make it, he'll bring it about. We are to know it, be alert, absolutely. All those things are important. But we need to understand, too, that the backdrop of our lives. So think about the backdrop. What I mean by a backdrop is the stage in which you are living today. So the stage in which you are in your life. You, know, you, have, your, you have your home, you have your family, your work. But what's, what's the backstage? What's behind you? What's the backdrop of all that you're doing? It's really the last days. You know, we are, I told you from the book of Acts, chapter 2, we are in the last days. But we are in a situation where for quite a long time, the church has been heading toward this direction, the direction of the coming of the Lord. And it's going to be like that until he comes. We're heading in that direction. Now, the interesting thing is Jesus said he comes quickly. Now, what quickly means doesn't mean he comes like, you know, he rose again 33 A.D., just about, and uh, he wasn't going to come in 35 A.D. or 70 A.D. He didn't mean it like that. What Jesus said when he, kissed, when he said, I come quickly, is when he starts, when, when the events that lead to his coming begin, it's going to happen very, very quickly. That's what it means he comes quickly. Once it begins, it goes. It may take a long time to get there, but once it starts, it's go. It's a go time, right? So this is why we want to be prepared, because once it happens, there's no turning back. Once the seals are open, there's no putting them back, right? So uh, the Olivet Discourse. Let's go there real quick. The Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25. I will start in Matthew 23. I'll tell you what for a moment. But remember, for 60 years, this is all the church had about the return of Jesus. It's quite shocking sometimes to Christians to think about it that way because since I've been a Christian, this Bible has been complete. (laughs) I've always had the book of Revelation. But there was a time believers did not have the book of Revelation. Now, you could say that it's a great advantage. Of course, we have the complete Bible. As Christians in the first century were getting to know the Bible, it was revelatory. It was beginning to be progressive until the book of Revelation was finished. But the early church had no other way of understanding when Jesus was coming except for these verses. And so be careful not to get confused by starting in Revelation without having a really proper understanding of what Jesus said regarding his return. Now, there's, there are four, in the New Testament, there are four places where you'll find things regarding the end times. There are four places you'll find them. One, one is the Gospels. We're going to read them tonight. The Gospels is one of the places where you find eschatology. Things of the end. The second place you'll find them, the epistles. The epistles. Remember, the epistles are what the apostles learned from Jesus, then putting them in their writing, in their own writing, through the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Spirit, and then passing them out to the churches. So the, what we call the apostles' understanding, or the commentary on what Jesus taught. But it all begins with Jesus. The third place, it's Revelation. Yeah, uh, the last days, the book of Revelation is all about the last days. It's really all about eschatology. And the fourth place where we don't think about it too much is typological narratives, meaning that there are places in the scriptures where there are certain teachings, certain parables that Jesus taught that doesn't seem quite straightforward at the beginning in terms of what he's saying, but it's really about the end times or, or some kind of typology. Like in the book of Revelation, you have the red dragon, you have the woman, and you have the child. Well, you would be like, what does that have to do with everything, with anything, right? It's Revelation chapter 12. Well, it is about the end times. It's about Jesus is coming and about how Satan, the dragon, is about to devour him. And you can say, well, that happened during the Christmas story, right? Yes, but then if you keep reading, it says... Then the dragon turns against those who believe in Jesus. So it's a typological narrative. Yes, it's a dragon, it's a woman, and it's a a child. But then it becomes not just typology. It becomes now direct teaching that the dragon is Satan, and Satan goes after Jesus, but then goes after his people. All right, so anyway, Scott, do you have a question?
Yeah, yeah, but I'm referring to, yeah, it, yeah, for sure. But I'm referring mainly to the New Testament, just, just but it, it has typological narratives in the Old, for sure. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. All right. Now, let's look at the Gospels real quick, because this is our frame of reference. There are three what they call synoptic Gospels. Don't worry about the name synoptic. It simply means sin is so, uh, or together, and optic is, of course, we get the word view or, or we, optical, optical nerve. To look at them together. The three Gospels that you look at together, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? All mention something about Jesus' return. All mention something about Jesus' return. And it's quite interesting that not one of those books references a seven-year period. Just a just, just little side note. Not one of them references a seven-year period. The only seven that is mentioned in the book of, I think it's the book of Luke, it's the time in which Anna, uh, in the temple that Jesus went to, it's, a, it, it's this period of time where the, Anna's marriage, you know, how long it lasted. It's the only seven years in, all of the, in, in the Gospels that is mentioned. It'd be kind of odd, isn't it? Because you're like, well, I thought seven years was really the most important number that you can have. Well, yeah, but the Gospels don't seem focus on the seven years. The only seven years is mentioned is Anna's marriage. It's only referring to Anna's marriage. So meaning that it's ambiguous. It doesn't tell you when the seven years is going to start. It just reveals something, right, about those seven years, but not exactly when it starts. And, not, and the length of time is not even mentioned. And uh, now, when you read Revelation, it's a little more clear. It dives in a little more clear. Now, what are some of the passages in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Uh, one, one, we're going to study Matthew 24 and 25. The other one is Mark 13. Mark 13 and um, in Luke 21, those are the three passages, the main passages, right? There's a little bit more uh, regarding the Synoptic Gospel that Jesus talks about, really teaches on his return. Now, what about John? Because we're studying John on Sunday, and you realize that we're chapter 14 now. And uh, we just finished chapter 14, and you're going to realize, well, he hasn't talked about the end times at all. You know what John does? It is quite fascinating. John doesn't have a chapter on the end times like Matthew does. Actually, Matthew has a few. What John does is he sprinkles it all throughout his gospel. You'll find it all throughout the gospel in a very interesting way. Like John will talk about darkness and light. Remember when it says Judas went out after Satan entered him? And it says, and it was night. And it's to show you the way John writes in his typological thinking that it was the dark time. Satan had entered him, and he had gone away from the Lord, and there was no light in Judas. It was gone. And so now Judas become, you know what John calls him? The son of perdition. The son of perdition was also the title of the Antichrist, right? So these are things that are in John that you go, wow, I didn't really, he doesn't have a whole chapter. He kind of sets it up and all through his writing. Like in John 5, where Jesus said, I come in my father's name to the Jews and you would not reject me and you would reject me. But uh, another comes in his own name and him you will receive. And this has been true of the Jews for a long time. They have received every Messiah possible, fake Messiahs, of course, and they've rejected the true one. And in fact, the last thing they'll do is they will accept one who comes in his own name. Yes, they will accept the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be one who comes in his own name, right? Remember, the Antichrist will proclaim to be God. He, doesn't, he won't proclaim that he came from his father like Jesus did. He will come in his own name. Jesus came from the father. That was, that was his messiahship was clear that he came from the father. Another one's going to come in his own name. He's going to say he's God. And then he will be the fake Messiah. He will be the Antichrist. All right. So this is the three synoptics and then John. Very simple, right? Bottom line, when you studied it all together, right, you get the feeling sometimes that Jesus only talked about it one time. Right? When you read these passages, you go, man, Jesus just lived all his life and all his ministry got to, to the end. And he said, all right, now I'm going to tell you the whole thing. And when you read them very carefully, you find that Jesus actually talked about his return all throughout the Gospels. The only thing he did is at the end, he summarized it. And he gave us what we have 
is the Olivet Discourse, when he teaches from the Mount of Olives, right? So it's a summary. But Jesus has been talking about his return all from the beginning, all throughout the Gospels. He's been telling them, I'm going to die. Right? I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to die. I'm going to come back again. I'm going to come back from the dead, and I'm going to come back. And I'm going to restore all things. And, of course, the, the disciples had no idea what he was talking about because they were like, what? You know, you're going to die, and then you're going to come back? They didn't really quite understand it, as most of the time, we don't get it either, right? As we're walking with the Lord, you're like, how come it takes us so long to get it? Well, the disciples are no different, but at one point, they got it, right? Once they're in, empowered by the Spirit, and once Jesus rose from the dead, they'll be able to write these things. So Mark mentions it at the end of Jesus' ministry. Luke mentions it all throughout the gospel, and Matthew sums it all up, right? Sums it all up. And this is what, um, remember the passage? This is from Matthew 10, when Jesus said, I'm going to send you as sheep among wolves, right? Matthew 10. And then he tells them, don't be afraid of persecution. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body, right? And it's all about what is going to happen to Jesus, what is going to happen to his disciples, what is going to happen to those who come and follow him, right? And this is why Jesus spoke about the end times, because he was going to be the one that this happened first. Then it was going to be his disciples, and then it will be everybody that follows Jesus will have to go through the same thing. They will be misunderstood. They will be betrayed. They will be persecuted, right? But all in all, he says, don't be afraid. Just don't be afraid, because this is what prophecy is like. Prophecy is like a pattern. Prophecy is like a pattern. It first happens to Jesus. Then it happens to the apostles. Then it happens to Paul when you read the book of Acts. And then it happened to the early church, second century, third century. And then Jesus makes this prophecy that it'll happen also to the believers that live in the last of the last days. Okay? So remember, prophecy is not just saying something. It's going to be fulfilled. Prophecies looking at the Bible and say, hey, this happened, then this happened, then that happened, and that happened, and ultimately the book of Revelation tells you it will happen, final time, right? And so it'll be the end, and that's what we study, the last of the last days. And this is what the Olivet Discourse is all about, biblical patterns, finding biblical patterns. And so when we find biblical patterns, we can see a little bit more clear. Now, let's go to the Olivet Discourse, and I told you Matthew 23. Look at verse 37. I want to start with this. As Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this is interesting. Then chapter 24 begins. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away with his disciples to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone was upon another which will not be torn down, which that actually happened to, uh, to, to the temple in 70 A.D., as Jesus, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him, tell us what will these things be, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, notice how Jesus began to weep over Jerusalem, and then he begins to talk about the Jews before he talks about the signs of his coming. Why is that so important? It's because of this. In order for you to understand, really understand biblical prophecy, what's going to happen at the end, there's one thing you need to understand. The Jews have to be back in Jerusalem. Jesus says right here, he weeps over them because they've rejected him after his triumphal entry. I wanted to gather you. I wanted you to be my people, but you rejected me. And then he says, now it's going to be judgment upon upon Jerusalem, upon the Jews who were there. But I say to you, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's a prophecy about the Jews. They're going, to have, they're going to have to be back in Jerusalem in order to say that which Jesus said will happen, right? It's a prophecy. The Jews will have to be back in Jerusalem to actually fulfill the words of Jesus. In 70 AD, the Jews were kicked out of Jerusalem, right? 100 AD, they were kicked out completely out of the land of Israel. There was no very, very, very little Jews for 
2,000 years until 1948, 67, they began to flood. It actually, it happened before then. It happened before the late 1800s. Early 1900s, they began to move, and, and World War I happened, and then more moved, and World War II happened, and then more moved, and 1967, they got control of Jerusalem. And now, okay, they're not on the news, right? Israel's not on the news at all. That's a joke, right? Of course they're on the news. It's, it's, it's the hottest, most important subject, according to the U.N. So the, Jesus is saying it's absolutely true. If you're going to understand his coming, watch what happens in Israel, because part of his coming is that the Jews are going to have to receive them. Those in Jerusalem, they're going to have to be back there. Now, let's say, you know, let's just say for a moment that Jesus said, yeah, they have to be back in Jerusalem, but there was no Jerusalem today. That the Jews will have to be back there, but most Jews live somewhere else. You're like, there's no way this verse could happen. You know, for a long time, people looked at that verse and they said, this can't be true. Do you know where most Jews lived at one point? Brooklyn. Yeah, uh, or France, or England. Now they're fleeing back into Jerusalem. Last century, now. Most, a lot of Christians looked at this verse for a long time, for centuries, and they said it has to be something spiritual because there's no way, there's no Jerusalem, there's no Jews living there. I mean, how can this happen? And you know there were some Christians like Charles Spurgeon and John Wesley who would say, hey, the Jews have to be back in order for this to be true. If Jesus said it has to be true, so they have to be back. Now, they were way ahead of their time, 200 and some years before their time. But that's the, what a lot of Christians believe, that this, this could not have happened. How can this be? Now you and I don't have that problem, don't we? Because I can tell you that Jews live in Jerusalem, and you could say, yeah. And I can tell you that Jews live in Jerusalem because I was there. And I have friends that live in Jerusalem that are Jewish believers, right? So... This is going to happen. So the first thing off the bat, if you're going to understand the end times, understand what God is doing with the Jews. It's this ancient people. He wants to bring them to salvation. There are some who have. Praise the Lord for that. I met some of them. And more are coming. But the Bible says they will have to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If you want to read more about it, I won't have time tonight. It's Zechariah chapter 12. What it literally the prophet sees what's going to happen at the end, and he says, the Jews will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, Jesus, as one mourns for, his own, for their only son. And this is quite interesting because a lot of the churches today will, will buy into this idea of replacement theology, that the Jews have no dealings with God's plan for the future. The Jews have no dealings with God's prophetic plan. And all of it has been replaced by the church. All of it has been replaced by the church. And so they call that replacement theology, right? Replacement theology. And, uh, well, you saw right there that Jesus says the Jews will have to be back in order to proclaim him as the king in Jerusalem. So replacement theology never made a lot of sense to me because it literally says that the church actually replaces the Jews. Now, Jeremiah 31, 31 is a very important verse. It's in the Old Testament, but it's about the New Testament. It's called the New Covenant. If you read Jeremiah 31, 31, you'll find that Jeremiah says, God is going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the old covenant, which he made with their fathers, the Mosaic covenant, but it'll be a new covenant, which God will write the law in their hearts. They will have their sins forgiven. They will walk with God. They will have no one... There will be no need for anybody to tell them about the Lord because they will know the Lord personally, each one of them. And that was the new covenant. When was the new covenant inaugurated? It was prophesied in Jeremiah, but it was inaugurated when? When was it? No. No, it was not. That's a good, you know, that was the right answer to the other question. Yeah. It was inaugurated on a night in which Jesus was betrayed. He took the cup He took the bread, and what did he say? This is the new covenant, right? The new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sin, right? That was the new covenant. The new covenant began in the Old Testament with the Jews, but now the new covenant expands to all believers. All who are grafted in through faith in Jesus are able to partake of the new covenant. And so replacement theology makes no sense because the new covenant actually started with who? The Jews, 
Who was there at the night that Jesus was taking the, the supper, the last supper? Just Jews. The new covenant was prophesied, inaugurated with who? A bunch of, you know, Vikings and Mexicans around? No, a bunch of Jews around, right? They believed in Jesus, right? And so it started prophesied with the Jews. It began, it inaugurated with the Jews, grafts Gentiles all throughout the nations, right? Spanish nations, Latin nations, Australia, you, you know, Viking nations, European nations, Asian nations, right? African nations, all who believe. And at the end, back to the Jews. If they believe in Jesus, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They'll be brought into their original new covenant, right? But if, see, this, this should be basic for Christians, isn't it? wouldn't it? If you understand the new covenant, which is, we're all happy that we're in the new covenant, aren't you? Aren't you happy? I am. I'm happy. Why? Because the new covenant gives us who alongside Jesus? It gives us the Holy Spirit, right? Which is the, 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 the spirit of grace, the spirit of, uh, the spirit of Jesus in us, right? Without the new covenant, you wouldn't have the Holy Spirit, so we're all very happy about the new covenant, and we all kind of understand the new covenant, but we forget the fact that the new covenant began with the Jews, with the Jews. So you see, it, it, this is how bad it's become in, in the churches, that something basic for Christians to understand, they don't even get that part. They don't even understand that part, and so that's why the confusion needs to go away in more clarity. Now, let's get into it a little bit more. The first five verses of chapter 24 are Jesus, they, they're asking Jesus questions about the temple, which he said it will be destroyed, which it was. Then they began to ask him questions about his return, the sign of his coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus says something, I think it would have shocked them. It certainly shocks me. It shocks me every time I read it. Verse 4, see to it that no one lies to you. See to it that nobody lies to you, Right? Why is that so important? Why would Jesus, I mean, if you're going to ask him about his, remember, this is the week before the cross, or the week of the cross, I should say. In a few days, Jesus will have the Last Supper with his disciples. He'll be betrayed, he'll be crucified, and he will go through this torturous death, and then he'll rise again. But if you're going to ask Jesus, Jesus, you know, what's the most important thing you want us to know about your return? He says right away, make sure nobody lies to you. Why is that so important for Jesus? Why does he start off like that? Yeah. See, there's one thing that's going to come, and make no mistake about it, Jesus said it, and actually mentions it four times. Look at verse 4. There'll be false Christ, those people who say, I am the Messiah, verse 5, and will mislead many. Not a few, many. So from the lips of Jesus, and two more times he's going to say, What's for deception, right? Four times he says it more than any other thing in the whole chapter 24 of Matthew, more than any other thing, he says, make sure nobody lies to you. And I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, most of the lies that come into the church today come through teachings about the end times, right? Whether it's Jesus comes tomorrow or Jesus comes you know, like he's going to come on a certain day, or he's not going to come at all, or he's, he has already come. There are all these kinds of teachings, seriously. And, and you'll hear more. You'll hear more as, as, as time goes on. But the one thing Jesus warned us about, we should not be even surprised by it. And we should always be healthy skeptics. Because he said that people are going to try to mislead other people in his name regarding his coming. Right? So that's the first thing he says. Right? Remember, Paul the Apostle said the same thing, first, uh, same thing also. When writing to the Thessalonians in his second letter, he warned the Thessalonians not to believe a fake letter that was sent to them. There was a fake letter in Paul's name sent to the Thessalonians. Yeah, that's how brazen the false teachers had become. It wasn't just speaking false things. They actually forged a letter in Paul's name sending it to a church and told them that they had already missed the rapture. And people were confused. Well, I would be too. And so Paul has to clarify. And he says, you know what's going to come first? He says, the apostasy comes first. Then the man of sin is revealed, right? And so he has to clarify the way it's going to go. But same thing that Jesus says. First, they will be in apostasy. What is apostasy? 
there'll be a falling away of people from the truth. There'll be a falling away of people from the truth, so they will no longer believe the truth, or rather believe a lie. Well, that's deception, isn't it? That's deception, and that's what's going to happen first. Paul reiterates it the same way, right? It was going to happen first, right? So deception in the church is coming. Do you know one thing that is coming really, really fast into the church? It's annihilationism. Watch out for that. What is annihilationism? Anybody know? It's a fancy term, isn't it? That's right. The belief in the church is we are going to get rid of hell. There is no hell anymore. Aren't you glad? Right? It's a, well, it's a belief system that we don't, we, you know, hell is so bad, we're just going to, I have my erasable Bible. Can I erasable Bible? Anybody have an erasable Bible? And just come and just erase that little part about hell all throughout it, and then you'll have a happy Bible, right? Because people don't want that word in there, right? And there's cult. There are cults who don't want that. It used to be Jehovah's Witness, Mormons. That now is supposedly, supposedly they're Christians who say, yeah, they don't believe in hell anymore. And that's coming into the church very, very fast through teachers and seminaries because, you know, we are more sophisticated now. We're more sophisticated. We don't believe in such barbaric things like that. But you know who taught about hell more than anybody? Jesus. Do you know where we get the doctrine of hell from? Yeah. Do you know the apostles never taught it? They, they mentioned, you know, they, they alluded to it. The prophets didn't teach it either. The, the prophets just said it existed. But if you want to know what hell is like, Jesus is your man. He tells you all about it. In fact, if I were to compare, compare the verses about hell that Jesus spoke about versus heaven that he spoke about, he spoke more about hell than it is about heaven. Why is that? Is Jesus negative? Should we have said, you know, we don't receive that in the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. No. Jesus spoke about that because he doesn't want us to go there. And he did everything he could to keep us from there by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. So, but that's going to come in his name. Major, major lies. So, uh, let's look at this real quick. We're not going to go through all the verses, just, just to give you an understanding. There will be four signs, or sorry, four places that the signs of his return will be visible. If you're going to see places, you're going you're gonna to look at the world today, and you're going to be like, where should I be looking at? Well, Jesus said in verses 6 to 8, look at the world. Look what's going on in the world. You know, we're going to find the signs of his return. You're going to find them in the world. What are you going to find? Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, right? You're going to find deception. You're going to find deception, all kinds of lies. That's going to be in the world. You know, the next sign, the next place, I should say, where they're going to find it is look to the church. In verse 9, and look at the church. What's going to happen in the church? Well, tribulation, persecution, false prophets, right? Apostasy. But he also says the gospel will be preached to all the nations. So, so, in the, in the prophecy of Jesus is that the church will become smaller, will become persecuted, will be more, more refined. But you know what? It will become more centered on the Great Commission because the gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth. Then Jesus says, verses 15 to 21, look at Jerusalem. When you see the abomination of desolation. What is that? It is the place in which Daniel the prophet said, in Daniel 9, Daniel 11, that there will be a one, one person coming into the temple of God and setting up an abomination. What is the abomination? Well, in Daniel, he says, it's the wings of abomination, right? Meaning it was something that happened, but it wasn't the final one. It was when the Greeks set up their gods, uh, the king of the Greeks set up his own god in the temple of God and killed a pig on the altar and spread the blood of the pig where the blood of the lamb would go. And that was an abomination of desolation. But then Jesus said, no, but it's when you see it, when you see. So it happened already. So when you see it, when are we going to see it? At some point in the end. And it's going to be in Jerusalem, standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand, those who are in Judea, get out of there. It's going to be the Antichrist is going to come and he is going to set up the abomination that causes desolation. That's going to be the sign. You want to see the sign of Jesus? Look at those three places. But there will be another sign. And this is a wonderful sign. It will be in the heavens. What is that sign? It will be the sign of the coming of Jesus. It will be in the heavens because 
All of heavens will be interrupted. The sun, the moon, the stars will stop giving its light. They will be interrupted to the point where there's going to be only one thing or only one person shining that day. It'll be Jesus. And no one's going to miss him. He'll be visible completely because everything is going to go dark except him. He'll be the brightest, most shining star. As Peter says, the bright and morning star will shine. And the Bible says he will gather his chosen people. He will gather them. You know what that word gather there in verse 31 is? It's the same word that Paul uses for the rapture in his letter to the Thessalonians. He will gather, he will rapture his people, his chosen people from all the four corners of the earth, meaning the four winds of the earth, meaning the four north, south, east, and west, right? east and west, and will gather them to himself, right? And so, hallelujah, praise God for that, right? That, that's going to be the ultimate. It's the ultimate revelation of Jesus. Now we see him by faith. Now we'll see him face to face. It's the ultimate glory of every believer to see their Lord, to see our Lord face to face. Having said that, and we have a few minutes to go, look at verse 6. What Jesus says is this. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Make sure you're not frightened by these things. You're sure you're not afraid. Don't be afraid because the end is not yet. The end is not yet. The end is still to come. It is not the end. So we're not to confuse certain signs as the end sign, meaning the ultimate return of Jesus, right? It's almost like ladies who've had babies, right? right? Ladies here have babies. You don't confuse contractions with the birth of the baby, right? Just because you have a contraction doesn't mean the baby is born right there. Amen, right? I've never had one, but you guys could tell me. Right? Don't confuse contractions with birth. There are things about birth that are different than contractions. I know you're getting a whole science class tonight, right? It's contractions is one thing. Delivering the baby, quite other thing. That's what Jesus is saying. Birth pangs, but it's not my return yet. Right? Don't confuse earthquakes, tremors all around the world with the ones in the book of Revelation that's going to shake the whole world. That's going to shake the whole world. And so don't confuse the signs of wars and rumors of wars with Armageddon. That's what Jesus is saying. Because that's what happens a lot of places. A lot of places in the church today is they confuse the birth pangs or the contractions as if the baby is going to be born, meaning Jesus is coming back. That's the way that Jesus pictured it. Jesus pictured his return like a woman in contractions having a baby. Well, contractions are one thing. Having a baby is another thing. But then he says, look at verse 15. There is, a, uh, verse 14, sorry, uh, a time when he's going to come because it says the gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth, the whole world, to all nations, and then the end will come. So first he says the end is not yet. Don't confuse it. Don't, don't be frightened by these things. Then he says, now the end will come. Once these things are set up, once the church has begun to continue to preach the gospel, let's just say, and the signs of the end are there, then it is going to come, right? It's, it's coming, but not now, but at some point, it'll happen. So these birth pangs, right? This tribulations. Then Jesus says, great tribulation. Then he says, I'm coming, okay? Right? So in verse, uh, look at verse 8. These are the beginnings of birth pangs. Right? Verse 8. Then he says, verse 9, they'll deliver you to tribulation. So these are like little signposts that Jesus is putting on our, on our mind. Look at the birth pangs. Look at the tribulation. Which, by the way, every believer goes through tribulation. So it's nothing unusual for believers to go through tribulation. Jesus says, in this world, you'll have tribulations. You will, you know. You use that word right there, affliction, distress, the ellipsis. You will have them, right? So don't be afraid of it. You've always had them, right? In fact, you're going through them right now. You know, if we're, if we're honest, we're, it, there's always a tribulation that we're being afflicted uh, to. Then he says in verse 21, then there will be great tribulation. Now it's mega. Now it's happening in a, in a greater capacity, Right? Then he says, then he comes in verse 30 and 31. Then the begins the ultimate judgment, the day of the Lord. 
So these are some of the things that the way we, we ought to look at it. But see, we have to just go through Matthew 24. We first have to go through it. Um, but look what the Lord says in verse 22. I love this verse. I love to share it because Christians, we get, we get rattled, right? We go, oh, man, tribulation, difficulty, and then great tribulation. Oh, man, this is going to be horrible. But look what Jesus says. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of those who my chosen people, for those who are elect, those days will be cut short. So God himself, Jesus himself, will cut the tribulations short for us. The great tribulation, as I say. He'll cut it short by his coming for his church. So no matter how difficult things will become, and difficult things are coming and have come. I was listening to Brother Dennis's prayer today. It's difficult, and, and it's getting difficult. At some point, as great tribulation approaches, the Lord will come and deliver you by cutting it short, meaning it won't let it go to the full extent uh, it could have gone, but by coming for us, he will cut it short. Now, the rest of the study, we only got a few minutes left. Um, look at the end of Matthew 24, because I want to show you something that uh, Jesus said regarding his return. In Matthew 24, before he, remember, there's, there's two chapters to his teaching on the end times. There's two chapters, 24 and 25. So I'm going to go through quickly on the parables that he taught. But this one thing he said, in the middle of chapter 24, he says, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Right? There are two things that Jesus said about the end that we have to pay so great attention. And this is where it becomes like, this is why I left it for the end. Because most Christians want to know the signs. Most Christians want to know what's going on, and rightly so. We ought to know. But it should not be in exchange for what Jesus told us to do or warned us about. And this is one of the warnings, he says. It'll happen. Because of lawlessness abounding, the love of many, speaking of the believers, will grow cold. I'll tell you why this is for believers. He also said this. This is in another, cha- another book, in the book of Luke. Jesus said of his return, will he find faith on the earth? So the Son of God said two things are going to happen to believers. Love and faith would be at risk. Love and faith will be at risk, right? Meaning that Christians will become less faithful and become become less loving. And this is going to be part of the end. Now, it's a prophecy, but notice this. It's a prophecy, but it doesn't have to happen to you and to me. It's something that is going to happen but it doesn't mean you have to be a part of it. Meaning this, how can we control the events of wars and rumors of wars? Can you control them? I can't. Earthquakes, famines, what the globalists do, what the governments do, I, don't, I can't control them. I don't have that power. Neither can you. But there's one thing you could do. Obey the words of Jesus. And when he says a lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold, we are responsible for this. We are responsible to keep our love warm for other believers. Now, this is the word for lawless, right? Now, most people that I've seen, most teachers that I've seen, usually talk about lawlessness. They look to society and they say, oh, how horrible things have become so lawless. Anoma, anomos, anomia. Things have become without law. And that is an application for sure. That's an application for sure. But what Jesus meant by lawless It's within the church. It's within the church. How can the church become lawless? Well, it's very simple. How is lawless connected to love? Right? Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Very simple is is this. In a recent survey, 60% of Christians believe in God, or 67% of people in churches believe in the God of the Bible, but not the Bible. 67% believe in the God of the Bible, but not the Bible. I know, I know, sounds weird, isn't it? How can that be? How can you believe in God, but not believe in your Bible? Well, how did you get the knowledge about God? (laughs) From the Bible, right? But how can you believe in God, have an idea of God, and not really 
believe that the Bible is the word of God. But this is how far we have become, how far we've gotten into this. Uh, other surveys among church attendees, right, is the fact that you can, you can um, a lot of people in churches believe Jesus sinned, that Jesus is not sinless. That's what was shocking. One of the sh- most shocking surveys that I've read is that people in churches, I think it was like 45%, it was almost half, but it wasn't full half, of people in churches in this survey believe that Jesus actually is not sinless, that he had actually sinned. I think that's a very fundamental thing, that if we don't believe that from the scriptures, uh, that, that's a big problem. That's a huge problem, right? And other things that will shock you, meaning this, that more and more people within the churches have become less and less knowledgeable of the Word of God, believing the Word of God, holding on to the Word of God, and guess what the result is? Remember, because lawlessness will abound. So we're without law. We're without the law of God. We're without His Word. We're without His teaching, His testimony, His precepts, right? So guess what's been happening? Love God and loving others have gone way down. Why? Well, Jesus said it very plainly. You know, Jesus defined it, right? So when, when they asked about love, Jesus didn't go, well, love is like, you know, he went to the scriptures and he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's Matthew 22. And love your neighbor as yourself. Where does that come from? The Bible. He got it from the Bible, right? Jesus defined love by, did he define it by some emotion? He defined it by the Word of God, the objective reality of the Word of God. That's how he defined love. When you no longer believe the Bible, you no longer have a definition of love anymore. You've lost it. You lost your compass. Now you can love anything. You can love whatever you want and call it love because you have lost the objectivity, you know, the, the, the ultimate reality. By the way, most people live in their own reality, right? They call it, they call it personal truth. And it's very different than the ultimate reality, right? And, and the people get mad because when you tell them about their ultimate objective reality, they get angry because they like their subjective reality, their subjective truth rather than their objective overall truth. Yes, Scotty. That is true. That's very true. Now, Jesus even made it more clear to us, right? Even more clear to us when you go into the final week of Jesus, his final week in John 13, 34, right? He didn't define love by just loving God, right? He actually said, right before he died, he made it so simpler. Instead of two commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor, you know what he gave us? One. Love one another as I have loved you. He defined it in Scripture, right? A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So how simple did Jesus make it? You know, like he took all the commandments of Scripture. He made it two, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then even simpler, he simplified it, John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Simple, right? So hard to do. Now, you have two words in the Bible for love. There are four words in Greek, but the Bible only uses two. It uses agape and it uses phileo. Uh, this is not a Greek lesson, but it helps understand a little bit more. Right? Everybody knows the word agape, so I'll come back to the second one. Let's start with the first one. Phileo, right? We heard the word Philadelphia, stuff like that. Some people call it brotherly love. Yeah, that is true. It's, it's defined that way. It's literally like an affection. You, you're fond of somebody, like an affection. Uh, better be translated more like this. The object of your affection, right, the value is set by... You, right? So that's what affection is like. Like, So I have an affection towards something. I set the value of that love for that thing, whatever it is, right? So I'm the phileo. I, I love ice cream, right? I love ice cream. Therefore, I set the value on the object, right? I do it. Now, agape is different. It's, sometimes it's translated unconditional love. You know, that's not exactly right, but I, I know what people are saying. It is literally a divine love. It's God's love given to us, given to believers only, by the way, through the Holy Spirit. Now, because it's God's love through you, who sets the value 
on the object. God does, all right? And so agape, if we're going to agape one another, it is because God has set his love upon you. So let's say, Tyler, God loves you. He set his love upon you. I, by the commandment of God, have to love you. Because who sets the value? God. And I don't mean have to like, okay, I have to do it. But it's a willing love. It's, it's a responding love, right? Because he set the value. God sets the value on you and Alicia, right? And Alex, right? God sets the value on you. And we respond to that love. But if it was phileo, it would be like, well, I don't like Scott, you know? I like Joel better, right? I set the value on one over the other, right? And a lot of times Christians do that. They play this game, right? What they mean love, right? Too bad we don't have different words, right? Because if I say I love my wife and I love my dog, it's just the same love, right? It's the same word, love, right? And uh, in English, it's, 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 it's different, right? You have to, yeah, just one word. In Greek, it's very different. You would be able to know if you have an affection toward somebody or you have divine love for that person because the object or the value of that object is set by God or set by me. And this is why sometimes Christians don't love one another because they really don't have agape for each other. They have phileo. I determine if I'm going to love you because, I don't know, you did something nice to me or you didn't do something nice to me. You see the point? Now, if we're going to love like the Lord, right? Yeah, if we're going to love like the Lord, how are we going to do this? How are, we going to be, how are we going to be called to love like Jesus? How can we do it? Well, is it possible? Yes, it is. Now, take a look at this verse. Paul says, it's one, it's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Why? Because I, I like simple, simple things. I like to be told, like, this is what it's about. And this is one of those verses that we go like, dude, if you're going to know a verse, memorize this one. Okay, you guys ready? You got to memorize this one. The goal of our instruction. Ooh, I like that. The goal of my teaching, Paul says. You want to know what the ultimate thing that Paul wanted to get across to you? Was this. Love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Summarize it all. This is what Paul wanted to get across to all the believers. The goal of my instruction is this, that you have a, a love from a pure heart. Now, what does pure mean? Now, sometimes, right, sometimes um, it's translated clean, clean heart. And uh, like, like in the psalm, created me a clean heart, oh God. I think we talked about it at the man's group, right? And automatically people say, oh, it must be a sinless heart. I can't have that. Who can? And you're right. It's not a sinless heart. I mean, it would be impossible to have a sinless heart in this sense. Um, it's not talking about sinlessness. The word is catharsis, which we get the word catharsis, to purge or to clean. Uh, so if you, if you work in chemistry, you do your chemistry lab, you're trying to dilute something, right? And you're trying to create purity, right, in a solution, right? You want no, let's say you're trying to purify uh, water or, so, you have to, or gold. That would be a great example. So let's try to purify it, right? That's what the word means, to purify, to clean. It means no mixture. That's what the word means, no mixture. He wants a heart that has no mixture. Well, what kind of mixture? Think of your heart. Your, a pure heart is a heart that is uh, not mixed with loyalties. What do you mean loyalty? Well, I love God. And I want no other challenger in, in my heart, to, you know, in terms of my love for God, right? There's no mixture. My loyalty to God, right? I love my wife. I want no other mixed stuff in there, right? I have a pure heart toward her. I want a pure heart toward God, right? It doesn't mean sinlessness. It means that you don't tolerate any mixture in your heart toward things that God doesn't want, all right? So in a sense, let's talk about sin, Right? I, don't to- I, don't want to- I don't want to tolerate sin in my heart. So I have, a, I would say, a clean heart, a heart that's pure, no mixture. And therefore, I use God's word to purify my heart. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is why we apply God's word. 
God's word is the objective reality, right? And it's like a sword. And the book of Hebrews talks about it's sharper than a two-edged sword, able to distinguish, right, between soul and spirit, right? Between emotion and spirit, right? You know what the truth is. You know what God's word says, and therefore you don't want your heart to be mixed. Let's go to the next one because I don't want to keep you guys here longer than I have already. Uh, A good conscience. A good conscience means you know inside of your mind what's right and wrong. You know it. And you can, do, you can do it your way or you can do it God's way. And God's word shines in your mind and says, you got to choose which way you're going to do this. And your good conscience, if you want to keep a good conscience, you will choose what God's word says over your, your way. Right? Just like what Jesus did. Not my way, not my will, but your will be done. Right? And God shines in our conscience. His word shines in our conscience that we have to apply God's word despite my feelings. You're talking about feelings right there, uh, Joel. Despite my feelings, I have to do what is right before God. I have to keep a good conscience before God. And ultimately, a sincere faith. Or another translation, faithfulness, right? You're faithful to God's word, right? This is your, you know, this is your, um, you know, you have areas of compromise in your life. You have areas that need to be addressed. Well, the word of God shines in those areas, and then you have to continue to follow and obey the Lord in that area. Do you know what happens to us sometimes? You know, uh, this is why we don't, we don't walk like Jesus, we don't love like Jesus, is because we're compromised in one of these areas. We either have a heart that is not loyal to God, we have mixed loyalties, we don't have a pure heart, we have mixture, right? Or we're constantly choosing our way over God's way. We know what the Word says, but we choose the other way, a bad conscience. And we're not being faithful to God's word. We know what it says, but we don't obey it. And so those three things, if those three things are being tampered or affected, right, then you will have, your love will grow cold. You will have less, you would say, you will have more lawlessness in your heart, you would say. And therefore your love will grow cold. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll come back to that. Um, just, just want to finish because I know that we're running out of time and people are going to start looking at me funny. Uh, Jesus finished his teachings on the last days, right, with a series of parables. And I'm just going to go through the parables real quick. You read them on your own when you can. Uh, tonight, hopefully, so you don't forget it, right? These are, the, these are the ones he said. The first parable at the end of chapter 24 is about a servant, right, who finds out his master goes away for a long time. And after being faithful for a short time, he begins to get drunk. He begins to abuse his fellow servants. He begins to beat them because he assumes that his master is not going to come back. Then his master comes back at an hour that he did not think it was going to happen. And his master puts him out, right? And there are tremendous consequences. He puts him out with the hypocrites, and he puts him out with the, uh, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wait a minute. This was his servant. This was his master servant who went away, who went astray, who went and beat up other servants and treated other people very wickedly. Yeah, tremendous consequences, right? Because these are servants of God, so much for one save, always save, right? Who become wicked. And now they don't serve the Lord and have a place in eternal fire. Remember, make no mistake about it. There's a disciple of Jesus in hell today. His name is Judas Iscariot, who walked away from God, right? Truly his own choice, right? But remember that, right? that there's, there's consequences. And what Jesus is describing here is a servant who knew well, but did not do his master's will. And therefore, this is about this parable. It's about keeping the word of God to other servants, the church, right? This is a parable about keeping God's word with other believers in the church, right? It's such an important thing because when we become wicked and awful and begin to abuse other believers, right? This is a parable that teaches that, about our love growing cold. And where is it? And where do we find it? In the teachings of Jesus about the last days because the love is going to grow cold. And it says, make sure it doesn't happen to you. Next parable. Oh, no, not that one. Next parable is the uh, foolish virgins, chapter 25. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Some had, uh, five had oils, right? Uh, sorry, uh, 10 foolish virgins, right? 
Five of them were foolish. Five of them were prudent. Ten virgins. Five of them were foolish. Five were prudent. Five had oil. The other five did not have oil. When it came down to it, only the ones that had the oil went out to meet the bridegroom. The lamp is the word of God. The oil is the Holy Spirit. And this is about keeping the word of God in the, in the, in the end times, keeping the word of God in your own life, right? In your own life. This is personal, your oil, your lamp, walking with God. You have the oil, you have the lamp, and you meet the Lord, right? This is about keeping God's word in your life. The other one is about keeping God's word with the fellow servants, with the church. What's the next parable? It's the parable of the talents, right? Um, one gained five more, one gained two more, and one was afraid to lose what he had and buried it, and he lost it, and he lost it all. And this is about doing God's word, God's ministry to the world, right? Because they were supposed to use their talents for their master. And one did and gained five more. One did and gained two more. The other one, I don't know, my master is kind of severe and, and very difficult, difficult master. I'm just going to bury it and hide it. And the master comes and he says, you wicked servant, you didn't do what I told you to do. And this is about going and keeping God's word to the lost to the world, right? Every one of us have a ministry. Every single one of us have a ministry to the church, to yourself, and to the world, right? No matter who we are, God has called us and gifted us to be a blessing to the church, to be a blessing, obviously, in your own life, to keep your lamp, to keep your oil, and to the world. And when we don't apply God's word, right, we become loveless. We become a love. This is all about our love growing cold because we don't have the word of God, Interesting, isn't it? And then he finishes his final one. It's not a parable. It's a teaching about the sheep and the goats that he's going to separate them. And he says, you know, some of them visit, me, visit the, the poor, visited the ones in jail, visited the ones who had no food and water, and they did it unto me, he says. Well, when did we see you naked? When did we see you starving? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you in prison? When you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you done it unto me. Again, it's the application of God's word, Right? When love is there, it's there, there's an application of God's word. And we have control of this in our own lives. This is what I'm saying. This is We have the uh, ability to keep God's word, right? And so if we're not keeping God's word, right? If we're not keeping God's word, if we're not exercising love and agape, right? Then this is the time to do it. When do you get ready for a marathon, <laughs> the night before, you have to run. Oh, I have to. Now I have to stretch and go out and, and to the gym and, and make sure I'm there tomorrow morning at five. No, you will be dead very, very quickly uh, after you start running, right? You don't show up to the marathon the night before, or the, you don't start training the night before. You start training months and months and months and months ahead, right? So when Jesus warns us about this, you know, think about it. Why would Jesus give us a par- three parables in one teaching? about love and about keeping God's word about his, in the teaching about his return is because that's going to be the most important thing that you must keep. You must be ready. You must be ready not by knowing a date, right? You must be ready by being faithful. You must be ready by being loving. You must be ready by keeping God's word. And so you're not going to get ready for a marathon the night before. When tribulation comes, when the real tribulation sets in your heart, right? You're not going to get, okay, now I'm going to get ready. Okay, what was that passage again? I know I didn't come to Wednesday nights or Thursday nights or Friday nights or Sunday nights. I, I know I missed all the Bible studies, but now I'm ready to go because tribulation setting in. You know, who, who was that brother again that I didn't love at church all this time? Forget it. You want to start getting ready at that point? It's not going to work. The time to get ready is now. And what is coming it's what the Bible speaks of what is coming, uh, you know, a persecution of difficulties, of hard times setting in. You know, you're not going to have time to get ready at that point. The time to get ready is now. So you have the opportunity today to get things right with the Lord. You know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he let this, he let this teaching to his disciples, and he told them, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And the book of Revelation says that there's a time where people are not going to be able to make any changes anymore to their lives. There's a time where whatever you set your heart to do, that's what you're going to be. 
To the filthy, stay filthy. To the holy, stay holy. Meaning at some point during the, the eschaton, the eschatology, people are going to make a decision of who they're going to be and there'll be no time to change or repent back. And there's going to cement it. They're going to be cemented into that. And you know what I see? A lot of, a lot of Christians want to do this. Uh, you know, we, we, we preach about being, living a holy life. And a lot of Christians, unfortunately, they want to be, you know, I don't want to be holy. I want to be happy. I'll be holy later. You know, I want to be happy now. I want to have a good time now. And holy, ah, forget it. That, that's going to come later. You know what God says? He says, you know what? Be holy now. And you will be extremely, extremely happy later. If you're holy now, you will be absolutely rejoicing later. But if you're trying to avoid being living a holy life and just worrying about having a good time in this world and just being happy in this world and just, and I don't mean like joyful or anything like that. I'm just talking about abandoning God's word and stop living a holy life and just living like the world and just say, well, I'm going to live holy another time. I'll do it another day. It's not gonna, it, there's no guarantee that you'll ever will. And so this is, this is the time to start getting together with believers and putting God's word into action. And this is what James says, and we've been studying James, is don't be hearers only, deceiving yourself, but be doers of the word. James 1, to 25 is so important, right? We spent a whole chapter, a whole Wednesday night on it. Because this is what the end times are all about. The end times are not about knowing when the rapture is going to happen or when the rapture is going to be. The end times is really the ultimate test of faith and love. This is what the end times are all about. It's an ultimate test of faith and love. Do you really have faith in Jesus? Do you, and, and I can translate that word faithful. Are you being faithful to God's word? And are you exercising God's word by loving one another? On the basis of those two things, Jesus says, that's what's going to be like. Will he find faithful believers in the end that are keeping my word? And will they find love that's fervent, that's hot, that's willing to love each other, and not a cold agape that it's going to be found in many places? And so Jesus says, it's the ultimate test, and, and, and it's already happening. The apostasy is already happening. Don't make, make no mistake about it. The falling away, I mean... It's deep, guys. I don't know how to convey it any other way. It's going to get into your family. It's going to get into your church. It's going, to get in, it's going to try to get into your heart. And I've seen it. I've seen people, good, godly people, already compromise. Unloving to other people. Compromising in the area of love. Compromising in the area of faithfulness. Compromising in the area of, um, of fellowship. Right? I've seen it. I've seen it. I don't have to be, you know, surprised. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked, but I'm not surprised because Jesus said it will happen, you know. And so just, just know that it's, it, it's if, if we can't stand in, in a time of relative peace, by God's grace, we have that, don't we? We're going to be, you know, we, we had lunch today. We had dinner today, by God's grace. We're going to go home to our homes and have a, maybe try to have a decent sleep, right? Maybe not after this message. and be like, forget it now. But, you know, if God gives us the grace tomorrow, we have a time of relative peace. And we can live for the Lord and apply God's word and love each other in relative peace. What's going to happen when real tough times come and people are going to be, like, hating each other? And this is why you practice it now. This is why we have the opportunity to do so. And so um, let's do it together because no man is an island. And Paul the Apostle told us this. It's faith, the book of Galatians, faith working through love. It's always that. Our faithfulness to God, working through the love of God, to love God and to love each other. And that's what the ultimate test of the end times are going to be. Right? Will he find faith on the earth? And will your love be cold when he comes? And I pray that none of that is true. When he comes, that he will be found faithful, well done, good and faithful servant, and that your heart and love will be fervent and hot and passionate for him and for one another. Let's pray. Lord, in the times that we've had, Lord, may you cement things in our hearts that we need to know. May you remind us of the things that we are to have and to be ready and to be like the faithful virgins in, in, in the parable that had oil, that had a lamp, that were ready, 
ready for the bridegroom. Uh, Lord, it's difficult. It is no doubt difficult. We have to die to ourselves. We have to follow you. We have to see yourself, Lord God, as primary in our lives and to see others, Lord God, uh, as important and more important than myself. So, Lord, help us to apply these things in our lives. Lord, when it's, when it's relative peace, we could do it much easier. When it's much tribulation, it's a lot harder to do. So, Lord, help us to do it now. And, Lord, and we can't do it apart from your Holy Spirit. We can't do it apart from submitting and yielding to your Spirit, carrying us through and empowering us through to apply God's Word. So, Lord, we thank you and praise you for what you'll do. Remind us of these things, Lord God, that on this week, when we celebrate, uh, Lord God, your death and your resurrection, we remember it, Lord God, we remember it, and we and think upon it great fondness, Lord God, that you died for us, that you gave yourself for us, and that you rose from the dead, Lord, to forgive our sins and to give us eternal life. Thank you, Lord God, and help us to respond to that message with faith, with repentance, with love, and we ask you to help us in that, Lord God, and we submit to you, Jesus, as your spirit leads us, we ask you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you on Sunday by God's grace.